And we have arrived. Sorry. Just had to put the parking brake on. <clears throat> um, here we are at the quintessential Doctor Who era. That of the eccentric bohemian doctor, played by eccentric bohemian actor and almost monk, uh, Tom Baker, who is also really good at construction. He's, um, he's okay in his first season. Um, I'm certainly glad that the Jelly Babies were introduced in the uh, previous era, so they're not too out of place when uh, the fourth doctor says, would you like a jelly baby? Uh, as for his first season as the doctor, um, Alan Z. First, the doctor runs across a think tank of geniuses who turn out to be neo-Nazis. Yes, and they're not even from Illinois. Apparently these uber nerds, or should I say uber mensch nerds, want to basically take over the world, of course, because they want to rule things their way. They are fascists of the highest degree and hypocrites because they're British. I mean, Hitler pounded the British with the Blitzkrieg for who knows how long, and now these people want to emulate the guy's work? Good grief. Talk about betrayal. The sad thing is, they have an eccentric doctor on their side. No, not our doctor. A new guy. Who looks more like a quintessential uh, eccentric scientist. It seems he built a robot that is made of living metal that can grow and heal and it actually feels. It's, it's close to being human, which is sad because when it's given orders to kill, which goes against its primary programming, it starts to go insane, the poor beast. Luckily, the doctor, Sarah Jane, the brigadier unit, and a medical officer, Harry Sullivan, who is fairly competent in this episode, all band together to stop the neo-fascists, but unfortunately when the doctor, the other doctor, tries to prevent uh, the robot from killing some innocent people, uh, the robot kills the doctor and ultimately becomes an uncontrollable threat, even though Sarah Jane kind of bonded with it. Also, um, the neo-fascists built a disintegrator ray, which is used to unfortunate great effect uh, in this episode, <clears throat> or should I say in this serial, but when it's used against the robot, the thing turns into a kaiju. And there are no megazords and no super sentai mecha, because uh, the last episode of this serial aired a couple months before the first episode of the first season of Super Sentai, so no help from the Japanese. <clears throat> it's up to the Doctor and Harry Sullivan to develop a metal virus with the help of some notes from the late Doctor in order to stop the monster. And yeah, it is sad to see him go, but he was a threat and he was in pain, so it was all for the best. It really is a bit of a sad episode, which oddly ended abruptly. <clears throat> and at the beginning of the serial, uh, we get a bit of comedy, quote unquote comedy, from the doctor, our doctor, as he proves that he's uh, stable after his regeneration. But he's really not. He does a quick uh, gallivant post regeneration in the TARDIS, or TARDIS, and 
He tries on several costumes, which are, would be very out of place before settling in on his quintessential look. Floppy hat, coat, uh, baggy clothes, oversized scarf from Madame Nostradamus, who used all of our yarn this time. But yeah, happily ever after, more or less. And so, um, to prove to Sullivan that the TARDIS is capable of movement, we head to the future, 10,000 years, to yet another arc in space. Only this one should have uh, put its cargo back on Earth 5,000 years ago by their reckoning. Turns out they got a bug problem. And John Goodman with corrosive chemicals will not be enough to save them. Because these bugs live in space, uh, their colony worlds having been destroyed by human colonists. Whoops. So now they're out for revenge. They get aboard a space station that's been sort of lost in space, even though it's in orbit around Earth. So, I mean, it's right there. So, uh, the bugs try to take over the humans that are asleep on the space station. And in doing so, jumpstart their brains to become more sentient. And their plan is to take over the humans on the station, take over Earth, and use that as a jumping off point for the rest of the universe. Maybe getting back their old colony worlds. Luckily, the Doctor, Sarah Jane, and Harry Sullivan end up on the space station and help uh, start waking up the sleepers and combating the bugs. Unfortunately, the lead human has been taken over by the bugs, and so they're using his brain to... Uh, help in their war effort. Luckily, there's just enough humanity left in him to, uh, to, um, get them all into the ship's escape rocket, which then, uh, is destroyed by, um, the guy who was now a bug. So, he had that going for him. Uh, unfortunately, the reason they landed here and not the moon is because Harry Sullivan kind of proved he can be a little bit incompetent at things. Um, he futzed with the controls, and that's why they landed 10,000 years in the future on a space station instead of on the moon in present day. Well, present day at the time. But it was fortuitous. If the TARDIS hadn't brought them to the station, then humanity would be hosed. Or should I say, bugged. But now that the rocket is toast, um, it's up to the Doctor, Sarah Jane, and hopefully Harry to get the station's transmat going so they can start sending people back to Earth, which... Uh, for a while was overheated by solar flares, but is now cooled down and can support life again. That's why they were up there. That's why they had an arc. In space. <clears throat> so, uh, now we head to Earth. Only to find a Santaran committing heinous experiments on a survey team, which landed on Earth to see if things were habitable again. Nerva, the space station, that's what it's called, having passed into legend like Atlantis. <clears throat> Luckily, um, when the Doctor, Harry, and Sarah beam down, they're able to assist the surviving spacemen in fighting the Santaran named Steyr, who is conducting experiments to see what kind of weaknesses humans have 
so the Santarans can uh, take over our section of space as it's strategically important in their fight against the electric jellyfish known as the Rutans. <clears throat> and as a nod to the fact that they reuse props and equipment and costumes on Doctor Who, Sarah refers to Steyer as Lynx, the guy from the earlier uh, Santaran episodes. And Steyer informs her that uh, Santarans are cloned. That's why they all look like. Luckily, the Doctor and Harry, on the Doctor's orders, futz about with uh, Steyer's energy replenishment apparatus, and the Doctor exhausts him in single combat. Oh, Tom Baker actually did this serial with a broken collarbone. So it's a lot of close-ups of the Doctor in a neck brace covered by a scarf and a stunt double. But luckily, Tom Baker is very resilient, and the Doctor beats Steyer till he's exhausted. Steyer, that is. And when he goes to replenish his energy, um, it drains what little energy he had, causing his head to deflate. That's a new one. And the reversed polarity, what's it that went on in the ship? That's it in the background. Um, causes it to blow up. So, no more Santarin. The other Santarans out in space are thwarted because they're very bureaucratic. So, without Steyer's information, they can't proceed. So, for the time being, Earth is once again saved, and the Doctor makes sure that the transmat is working perfectly. So, humans can now beam down to Earth and repopulate it. And so, Team TARDIS heads back to the Nerva space station in order to get back in the TARDIS and go home. Unfortunately, the Time Lords, who still need the Doctor to pitch in with stuff every now and then, even though they did forgive him for his little transgressions as the first and second Doctor, <clears throat> they bring him, Harry and Sarah, to Scarrow, home of the Daleks. Back before the Daleks were invented, back when the Thals and Khalids were still duking it out in a nuclear-scarred wasteland. The mutated among them being cast into the wilderness to live or die. And we see uh, a lot of, of the darker sides of humanoid nature in this uh, serial. The Khalids are completely obsessed with biological purity. That's why they cast the quote-unquote mutos out. And they're obsessed with killing Thals. The Thals are just as obsessed as the Khalids is killing them, or with killing them. <clears throat> and unfortunately, Sarah, Harry, and the Doctor get pretty knocked around by both the Khalids and the Thals. Especially when Sarah is, gets press ganged into a, a labor force to load a fall rocket with dangerous material in order to destroy them. Um, <clears throat> meanwhile, the Mutos have decided that it is the law that any non-Muto be destroyed. Well, luckily, one of the Mutos takes a shine to Sarah when they're both enslaved. So at least he's willing to be reasonable. And in all this comes a crippled, heavily mutated, I might add, college scientist named Davros. He's got one barely functioning hand, 
He's blind with the exception of a thing on his forehead to see. His voice is uh, enhanced electronically, and he's got a little wheelchair that's basically the lower half of a Dalek. And he is power mad. He believes that mutation is the ultimate uh, ultimate destiny for the Khalids. So what he wants to do is generate <coughs> excuse me mutated offspring and put them in armed travel machines. And he reveals them. The first Daleks. And yeah, they kind of look like the ones from the uh, early Pertwee era, the black and gray models, instead of the ones featured on the, uh, or featured in the uh, uh, Hartnell era. They even have the solar slats that they didn't have in the first serial. But they can be had waved away because over time the Daleks may be uh, cut down on materials and relied more on static power. So maybe they downgraded and then upgraded when they realized that uh, there was more life in the universe than what was left on Skaro. Unfortunately, when the Doctor, Harry, and Sarah finally meet Davros. The Doctor is forced to divulge all his future information, not to mention uh, weaknesses that the Daleks can overcome. And yeah, even though he tries to reason with Davros, the guy is just bat guano crazy. He would make a virus that would destroy all life just for the just for the sake of it, just for power's sake. And he refuses to acknowledge the fact that other people have a point. He calls life worthless. Considering all he's probably been through, it, it's a small surprise that uh, it's no small. It is a small surprise that. Uh, Davros is the way he is. He refuses to let his Daleks be anything but merciless, emotionless killing machines. And he's willing to sacrifice his own people. He lets uh, his Daleks murder scientists who were against him. He tells the Thals how to destroy what's left of his people inside a dome. He basically tells them how to penetrate the defensive dome so the rocket can destroy them. He then sticks his Daleks on the Thals just when they've celebrated victory, just so his handful of scientists and he can continue making Daleks. Unfortunately, uh, the Daleks end up turning on him as well, because he programmed them to see no one else as superior, which he figured didn't include him, but the Daleks, well, they had other ideas. And so, the created turn on the creator, and the legacy of the Daleks begins. Meanwhile, uh, when the Doctor gets set to uh, do his final solution. He had three solutions presented to him by the Time Lords. Discover a persistent weakness of the Daleks. Try to uh, um, make them evolve along less aggressive lines. Or wipe them from history. Actively change history itself. I mean, the Doctor will overthrow a dictator and go on his merry way, but he can't change established history. He, there are fixed points in time that he cannot alter. That's why he 
has such heavy hearts. He can't save the people of the Titanic or, or uh, those lost in the world wars or, or tell everyone to avoid flying on September 11, 2001. He has to obey the laws of time. And yeah, he puts forth the uh, old, if you knew a child would grow up to be a monster, would you kill that child? Personally, I would look for other solutions, but if there were no other solutions, yeah, I'd take him out. For the sake of those he would kill. But the doctor, uh, he hesitates at the thought of, of that much power. But ultimately, uh, Dalek takes out the incubation chamber of the new mutants for him. And while the remaining Khalids and Mutos did seal up the bunker in which the Daleks were entombed, he only set them back about a thousand years. Whether this affects... The first Doctor's encounter with them? I don't know. Maybe. Who knows? But for the first time in a long time, the Daleks are actually quite menacing. And Davros, he is just completely unlikable. As part of his plans, he feigns being a, a humble scientist and acquiescing to the demands of the people. <laughs> And uh, just assuming everyone around him is too stupid to do anything to patronize. But yeah, while the doctor failed, he didn't fail entirely. Hopefully the universe will forgive him for not taking out the people of Skaro, including the Daleks. Altogether. <clears throat> of course, I don't think the Daleks know the Doctor was responsible. And I don't think the Doctor told them that he was a Time Lord. So I'm sure this won't affect the future in any way, shape, or form. Moving on. It's back to Nerva. Only this time, they're in the past. Because the TARDIS seem to be moving of its own accord for some reason. Probably due to Time Lord interference again. Um, at this point in time, Nerva is uh, more of a scout beacon watching for uh, errant space rocks. And it's just before the solar flare activity starts cooking the earth. They even allude to this in a news report that Sarah witnesses. Anyway, um, it seems the uh, nervous station has picked up a rather large planetoid that has found its way to earth. The planet Voga, made almost entirely of gold. And no, the Vogons that inhabit the world are not the same ones from Hitchhiker's Guide. At least, I don't think they are. These Vogons are split. One group want to communicate with other alien life forms and maybe sell their gold to um, get back what they lost in their war against the Cybermen. Um... <clears throat> But the ruling class want things to say as they are. They want Voga to look and feel like it's lifeless, while the people live peacefully but in isolation. And both groups have a point. Um, it's their right to live on a proper world, but they also deserve safety and security. And so a civil war happens. And in the midst of all that, um, some Cybermen who survived the Cyber War with the Vulgans decide to get revenge 
because as it turns out, it was gold that helped the people of Volga and Earth take out the Cybermen. Because <clears throat> Cybermen don't like gold. It, it mucks with their system. Luckily, the Doctor, Harry, and Sarah are there to uh, assist. Ultimately, the Cybermen fail in their revenge. They had two plans. One was use a rocket to... Not a rocket. Um, use bombs placed at the center of Volga to vaporize it. And having failed that, they loaded down the Nerva station with bombs in order to use that. Luckily, the Doctor, Harry, and Sarah, through various means, including being taken hostage a couple times, managed to sweat the site to thwart the Cybermen and their uh, new, larger, snake-like Cybermats and save the people of Voga who have now reunited in their uh, fight against the Cybermen. And when all is said and done and the nervous station is back where it's supposed to be, ready to be used as an arc, in space! And the people of Voga go back to whatever it was they're doing. Possibly still disagreeing on whether or not to welcome other species or just go back to isolation. The TARDIS finally manages to reappear. With a strange ribbon-shaped message for the Doctor. It seems he gave the Brigadier a space-time telegraph, which has been going like a banshee in the time since they left the TARDIS till now. And so our heroes quietly depart in the TARDIS and head to their next season. When next we meet the Doctor, things get really crazy and the show gets a little more ahead of steam. Until then, Geronimo. And remember, extra-long scarves are very, very cool.